uh, you folks need to realize that uh, I'm going completely on my instincts right now. I'm running on instincts. You've heard the saying, you're running on fumes. Not me. I'm running on instincts. And so I'm talking to you about what I know is the right thing to talk to you about. And if I have to go off the Revelation script right now, I will. I have a man writing me telling me, Martin, stay on the script. You're supposed to be talking about Revelation. Deliver as advertised. Well, this is the Revelation series, and I'm giving you Revelations. But sometimes it's not going to be on the book of Revelation, because as I go through this series, things occur to me. Important things occur to me, and I'm going to give you those things. I'm going to go off the script. Simple. I'm doing it for me first. I take care of myself first. That sounds selfish, but it's not. I love my neighbor as myself. You're my neighbor. I love my associate, actually. The concordant literal New Testament says, as myself. And so I have to love myself first. And I have to do what appeals to me, what I think is right. And my instincts are usually correct. And what I talk about blesses you. What I talk about Even when I go off the script, you write me and tell me, I needed to hear that. That was perfect for me because I went off the script, because I'm not on a script. And look, I think we all need to be making life decisions based on the knowledge that the time is short, because the time is short. It really is. And we're going to be getting into this more when we talk about the constellation and the 6,000 years we've been since Adam. And we need to change the way we live. I mean, we, it's not, no, forget it. It's not like we need to change the way we live. When you receive this information, when the time is right for me to dispense this to you as part of the Revelation series, you are going to change the way you live. And you are going to change the way you make decisions. And the things of the world are going to grow dim. And it's a little scary, the prospect of leaving this planet. That's the prospect I'm faced with today and you're faced with. The prospect of leaving this planet, because we are going to leave this planet. As I told you yesterday, we don't belong here. And the time is near to our departure. You know how exciting it is when you're sitting on an airplane on the tarmac and those jet engines fire up and you start taxiing towards the runway and the pilot comes on and tells you, we are number five for takeoff. And you're number five. And then you're number four, then you're number three, then you're number two. And he takes that 90 degree turn. You know you're facing down the runway. And those jet engines rev up. And you know that within a matter of moments, you're going to be airborne. It's an exciting moment. It's a little bit scary too, isn't it? As seasons of a flyer as you may be, it's a little bit scary. But it's adrenaline. That's what I'm feeling right now. Oh yes, it is a feeling. My feelings are based on facts. My feelings are based on scripture. My feelings have a mooring in reality. And the reality, as I've been telling you, is the word of God. Along that line, I had a thought yesterday. Now, I'm still going to tell you a tale. And whether you like it or not, I'm going to tell you a tale about an Amish sign that I saw in someone's yard when I was walking eight miles a day in the state of Ohio to attempt to dissipate some of my angst and my anxiety concerning this call, which has me walking the opposite direction of everybody else on the planet Earth. Trying to survive here. Hello. And so in order for me to survive, I have to tell you a story about an Amish religious sign that I saw in a yard in Ohio that's going to illuminate some avenue of truth for you that's going to be perfect for you when I tell it. That's the confidence I have, that whatever I say to you is going to be perfect in its own time. Keep that on hold and keep the revelation of Jesus Christ on hold for now because I have a revelation concerning Paul's gospel. Okay, I told you a couple days ago that why didn't God just do the great thing first? Why didn't he bring just forget about death, bring life. Forget about um, Ishmael, just bring Isaac first. Bring Isaac first. Forget about Adam. Why go through the preliminaries? Just bring Christ to us. Why go through death? Bring life. Well, I had another thought. 
I had another thought about this. I had another example. Why bother with the circumcision evangel? Because I tell you this, what God is shooting for and what he has been shooting for and what has been in his mind the whole time is the uncircumcision gospel, the gospel of Paul. You see, that was in his heart the whole time, to lavish unworthy people with grace and to take them to a realm far above earth and to really regale and to show off his kingdom to losers and to make them players with him, fellow laborers with him in the reconciliation of the universe. And he does this, I remind you again, with losers. That's what he has in mind all the time. It's exciting because it's extreme. It's so extreme to give nobody's everything. It's, it's so extreme to give losers the ultimate win. You see, and this is the opposite of the Israel gospel. And I wish all of you were watching the laundry cam right now because I'm gonna do things with my hands like this and this, that it's going to explain to you the radicalness of our calling. It delights God to bring complete losers to an extreme expectation and an extreme realm of glory, beauty, and power. Glory, beauty, and power. To the ugly. To the weak to the ignoble, to the stupid, to those of no reputation in this world. But, but no, see, that, that's what he really wants to do. And remember, I've been telling you, he's shooting for the fifth neon. He's shooting for the new earth. That's when he's going, ah, this is what I've been shooting for. Why then are you doing all these preliminaries? Because they're a necessity. They're a necessity. It's necessary to introduce death before you introduce, introduce resurrection. It's a necessity to introduce Ishmael before you introduce Isaac. It's a necessity to introduce Adam before you introduce Christ. It's a necessity to introduce sin before you introduce salvation. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, this is a revelation to many of you for the first time today. It's a necessity to introduce the gospel of the circumcision before you introduce the gospel of the uncircumcision. Israelites aren't going to like this. Members of the body of Christ are going to love it. The circumcision gospel, the gospel of earning brownie points, the gospel of being worthy, the gospel of being baptized and circumcised and obeying laws and going to the temple and presenting your sacrifice, this was not in God's heart. He said that himself. Paul mentions it in Hebrews. The animal sacrifices, the killing of beasts, the shedding of blood. It was not God's dearest hobby to do that. It wasn't something he enjoyed. To him, it was a, ne a necessary prerequisite in order to introduce a greater message that he had in mind the whole time, but nobody's going to appreciate it. That's the whole reason underlying these contrasts and why God must bring out the negative before the positive. It's for the sake of the contrast. He needs death because otherwise you will not appreciate the greatness of life. He needs Adam. You will not, otherwise you won't appreciate the greatness of Christ. He needs all these pre- Records and down the list of everything I just mentioned. He needs the Ishmael. That's why I'm always willing to produce an Ishmael because I know the divine precedent that God produces the inferior thing, the weak thing, the fleshly thing, the soulish thing before he produces the spiritual thing, the great thing, the thing he's been shooting for all along. And so having been steeped for so many years in the necessity of the contrastive thing, I can relax in it and even be the channel of producing it. If you need an Ishmael, I'll do it. Not willingly. I'm not willingly going to produce an Ishmael. I'd rather produce an Isaac. I'd rather go directly to the new earth. I'd rather go directly to Paul's evangel, all this stuff. But no, ladies and gentlemen, even before I, Martin Zender, came into the truth of the grace of God, the transcendent grace of God, I, Martin Zender, or grasped onto the circumcision gospel. I was listening to a preacher named Ray Prinzing. 
And this guy impressed me. And I thought how great it would be to rule in the kingdom on the earth. And that was a great message to me. But I was introduced then to Paul's gospel. And the reason I got so excited about it, and the reason I'm animated this morning talking about it, is because of the contrast. I was bumped up a level. I was bumped up a level from having to be worthy, from having to think about living on a regenerated earth. As great as that's going to be, it's going to be great to live on a regenerated earth. Like so much to say. So many things are banging in my head. I had a revelation about the Garden of Eden. I'll say this, and then probably going to be tomorrow before I give you the, the reason why God had to do the circumcision. And I feel sorry for Israel because it, it's like they're a demonstration of the incapacity of human flesh to do the dictates of God. It's all an example. It's all given to us. Even Paul says, as an example the Israelite experience is an example to us so that we can learn from it. Poor Israel. They're being used as an example and as a contrastive element, as a contrastive force. And they're not the, be they're not the after picture. They're the before picture. I once saw an episode of the Flintstones where Fred Flintstone was asked to uh, appear in a a commercial and he was advertising some sort of diet program and um, they said Fred we just need to photograph you and um, it's gonna be great and Fred's like yeah but deba do he loved the idea Wilma was so proud of him that's all Fred lived for for Wilma to be proud of him and so this company came in and photographed Fred and he's like K -ch -k -ch -ch -ch. he's posing he thinks he's the after picture of the diet program but in fact Fred is the before picture He's the example of how it's going to be uh, when, you're, when you're fat and ugly and distended with misery. And some bodybuilder was the after picture. Fred thought he was the after picture. How embarrassing for Fred when the commercial came out and Fred was the before picture. Here's you now. Here's the way you can be. And, of course, Wilma was not impressed Fred, I forget how it ended up. Um, I imagine they all gathered around the table and had a brontosaurus burger and it all eased up. But Israel is the before picture, but they don't realize that. So they're all proud. They're all high and mighty. Even Israelites today, I see them in the street. They're so disdainful of the rest of us. But I have to admit to you, an Israelite smiled at me two weeks ago in Fort Lauderdale, a man in traditional Israel garb, the beard, the whole thing, the hat, the entire um, gamut of Israelite accoutrements, and he actually looked at me, which was amazing, me being a goyim, a dog, a pig, and he grinned at me. I don't know why. I was, no, seriously, I don't understand why he did that. Maybe he suspected in me that something was going on with me. I don't know. But it was a glimmer of hope that all Israel will be saved, and they will. But until then, they're arrogant, stuck-up people who assume that they're the after picture. But they're the before picture. This is a preliminary revelation, Israel is, a preliminary revelation of, let me say, let me say this. It's a preliminary revelation of grace. There is some grace in the Israelite message, uh, but you have to do things. You have to perform for God. You have to approach with reverence. You have to bow down. You have to bring your turtle dove. You have to bring your goat. You have to bring your sheep. You have to produce fruit worthy of repentance. You have to acknowledge the God of Israel. You have to keep idols from your home. You have to not marry a member of a competing nation. All these things you have to do, and God is going to give you the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. Oh, the meek shall inherit the earth. Yes, but the assholes inherit heaven. The meek inherit the earth, but the assholes inherit heaven. This is the great contrastive thing that I was showing you earlier with my hands. Don't let me forget the Garden of Eden revelation. Might have to give you that tomorrow. What a sidetrack. Listen, the meek shall inherit the earth, 
This was the program God laid out for Israel. In order to be meek, you had to do lots of things. You had to be baptized. You had to repent. You had to humble yourself. You had to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, or at least acknowledge that your forefather Abraham had something going on upstairs where he was giving you a message for the future that you would be the head and not the tail of all the nations and that you were to await a mighty man, a Messiah, a Savior, of whom Abraham was merely a dim progenitor. Yeah, and you had to do all these things, and if you did it just right, then you became meek. And Abraham was said to be the most humble man on the earth. He was a very humble man. And he didn't brag about it, otherwise he wouldn't have been humble. I'm the most humble man on earth. Ah, uh, you, just, you just wrecked the testimony, dude. But that's not the way it was. But here we have a message that I'm bringing you, the message of Paul, that rewards a greater boon, a greater prize, a greater destiny to people who are not only not meek, but they are at times possibly arrogant, they are at times probably mostly stupid. They are at times lost in this world. They can't find their car keys. They can't even remember where they parked their car. They get angry at their mothers and fathers. They say things they regret. They use cuss words, the F word, the S word, the A word, the C word, all kinds of four and five letter words that they regret later. They get angry. They're self-indulgent. They're sometimes self-righteous. And yet, they believe a message that goes as follows. Your salvation does not depend on your worthiness. Your salvation does not depend on your degree of ability to worship or revere God. Your salvation does not depend on your behavior, on your attitude, on the way you treat other people. Your salvation depends solely upon the work, the intention, and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, on your behalf. And you now tie your life with his. And you like a jellyfish. You're like a jellyfish in a way. You're just like, I, I am no longer anything. I'm tying my fortunes with this one person. And if this one person doesn't do it, I'm never going to get it. Ooh, God loves that. That's it. That's saving faith. If this one, that is saving faith. If this one person, Jesus Christ, doesn't do it, I'm dead for the eons. I'm screwed. I'm done. That's the message. You tie your fortunes. You ally yourself consciously with another person. And your fortunes are now melded with his fortunes. Your death is his death. His death is your death, I should say. His entombment is your entombment, and his resurrection is your resurrection. His destiny is your destiny. Where is his destiny? Look at where he is now, at the right hand of God. This is what God awards people who are losers. This is the message of Paul. The, watch, watch the laundry cam. Watch the laundry cam. If you're an Israelite, it's not bad. Look where my hand is. Look where my left hand is, or however it appears on the screen. It's all reversed. I don't know. Look where my right hand is. God gives earth to people who are worthy. If you're meek, you'll inherit the earth. That's the Israelite message. And God needed to introduce that message first to prove that, for, for one thing, he is awesome. He is unapproachable. He is so huge that how dare you even approach him or pretend to think yourselves worthy of approaching him without the proper sacrifice, without the shedding of blood, without approaching with fear the Holy of Holies, speaking of one man once a year, the high priest. How dare you? How dare you? He's that big. Only then can we appreciate Paul's message that we have access with confidence to the Father. What? Access with confidence? How can that possibly be? Why would you even say how can that possibly, possibly be unless you've been acquainted with the previous revelation? So this is the Israelite message. God, God gives the earth to those who are meek. Paul's message is God gives heaven to those who are assholes way out here. God, God does the radical thing on both ends. On both ends, God does the radical thing. He takes the end that you have to be worthy 
Okay, you have to be worthy. You have to present yourselves to God. And then he, he stretches that out back and says, you don't have to be worthy of all at all. In fact, you can be a total unworthy. You can be unwise, weak, ignoble, and stupid. Then he takes the end game. For Israel, that would be the earth. You inherit the earth. And they're all excited about it. We're going to inherit a regenerated earth. He stretches that out and says, I'm going to give assholes heaven. So you can imagine how upset Israel was to hear that God had done this stretching thing with his message. But the circumcision message had to come first. Listen, I'm out of time. Tomorrow, way out of time. This is probably the longest show I've ever done. Tomorrow, I'm going to talk to you about my revelation concerning the Garden of Eden. Because here's another question. And I'm going to read some excerpts from the first idiot in heaven that I wrote. Why did the Garden of Eden come before the New Earth? Because the, the New Earth fulfills what the Garden of Eden started. It, this is a great revelation, and I'm going to give it to you. In the meantime, look, we need to be living like people who have a very short time on this earth. This ties into yesterday. We are expatriates. We are strangers. We are wanderers. We have no country. We have no home. And we need to start living like this. And we need to start planning like this because I'm telling you our time is short, possibly this year. I mean, yes, I'm serious. I'm going to talk to you more about this when we get to the constellation and when we get to the 6,000-year plan. We're 6,000 years from the creation of Adam. This is huge. It's huge. And so what I'm telling you is necessary. It's going to change your life. That sounds like a cliche, but with me, it's not. With me telling you that it's not, it's going to produce in you a way of living that is very, it would do the opposite of what you think. If you think you have a short amount of time, I'm going to go crazy. Give me a large order of french fries at McDonald's. No, this is actually going to cause you to be sober, to be still, to be peaceful, but and yet at the same time to be celebratory. And this is what I'm missing, ladies and gentlemen. This is what I'm missing. Maybe you're missing it too. I'm missing that celebratory aspect that we're almost done. That this terrible trial of living on earth is coming to a completion. And I'm missing the joy of that. But not anymore. I'm not missing it anymore because I'm tapping into the immediacy of our departure. I want you to do the same thing and I'm going to make you do the same thing by giving you not fiction, but facts.